Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. I hope you all had a reasonably uh, reasonably nutritious diet without too many calories and oil. At least that was our aim. To some extent, sugar and oil plus get used when you are doing fairly large scale cooking. Taste becomes the key. Uh, Dr. Dave, who will be chairing this session, is on his way. But you know what life is in the Archimi mode, Yusuf Sarai, etc. So when I asked him, he said, um, Kosakta hai, Andrami, Kosakta hai, these were his things. So, uh, what we are going to do is, we are going to start, uh, in the afternoon, we have three speakers. The airlines have played havoc with us from morning. And, you know, therefore there are changes all over, adjustments all over. In the afternoon, we have four speakers. Dr. Srina Tredi is the first speaker. Dr. Bhagavat will be talking about food fortification in place of Dr. Shankar. Dr. Kalemani will be talking about her favorite subject, which is anemia. And why around 3.30, Dr. Venkatesh will be back from a meeting when he will talk about government programs. In a way, it's very appropriate what began as a portion number one would end up as an Ayushman Bharat. It's a very appropriate one and he will also chair the validity session. Uh, Dr. Srina Pretty is very, very well known. He has, I mean, I, I will not read his biodata, excepting to state he was one of those not in the 80s who reached the top in clinical medicine. And then took a leap into public health saying, so far I treated, now to this time that I get into prevention so that this kind of treatment no longer is required. He has then moved from All India Institute to Public Health Foundation of India and in his own immutable style, he had supported public health movement. Huge uh, army of people from various disciplines have been nurtured into becoming public health. This is not a program that could be evaluated on a yearly basis and impact evaluations done on seven yearly basis. But if you wait, see. How did India meet the challenge of obesity non-community epidemic using all available land power and persuading him them all to treat the pathway of prevention? I think you will find Dr. Reddy and Public Health Foundation featuring as brilliantly as did the earlier people who had worked under nutrition, under nutrition prevention, under nutrition management, and who have succeeded in bringing down what under nutrition and morbidity and morbidity. I will not stand between you, Dr. Srinath Reddy, and I am very thankful to you for having accepted my suggestion that you will take a Stephanie chairman until such time as Dr. Dave comes in Zidin US. Thank you very much, Professor Ramachandra. As you know, Stephanie is a type that's kept in the best shape. Uh, always available for emergencies, but better than anything that's already been worn out on the road. So I'm delighted to have a Stephanie chairman, as you said. So, 
chairperson, room leaders in the audience, ladies and gentlemen. The challenge after lunch is always going to be not whether we are going to reach the sustainable development goal in fiscal after 2030, but whether the interest is sustainable in the project. Nevertheless, I will try and attempt to address some of the challenges that Dr. Ramachandran has thrown my way. Clearly, non-communicable diseases at the global level have been very obviously identified to be a threat to health and sustainable development and now acknowledged to be so. While they were omitted in the SDGs, in the MDGs, now they feature fairly prominently in the SDGs. We have 40.5 million deaths with non-communicable diseases cumulatively in 2016, accounting for 71% of global deaths, and 78% of those deaths due to NCDs have occurred that year in the low and middle income countries. And a very high proportion of the NCD deaths in the low and middle income countries are occurring in the very productive prime of midlife, which translates into also an economic loss which is based both on lost productivity and on healthcare costs. And the global cost for NCDs and mental illness has been estimated to be between but around $47 trillion between 2011 and 2030, according to a study of the Harvard School of Public Health and the World Economic Forum. So clearly, there is a huge loss that we are going to face to not take corrective actions. NCDs cause poverty, lost productivity, and high health care costs. But it is the loss of human life, particularly in the age group, between 30 and 70 that has attracted attention because of its impact on productivity. Now, between 2010 and 2025, the deaths from four main non-communicable diseases will rise from 28.3 million to 38.8 million, that means 10.5 million extra deaths. Of these 10.5 million additional deaths, 9.5 million, that means the vast majority will be the low and middle income countries and about 40% of those deaths will be under 65. And if you look at the global cost of cardiovascular diseases, we recognize that between 2015 and 2030, just from cardiovascular diseases, there would be a 16% increase in the economic cost that is associated with these diseases. And that amounts to a staggering $146 billion. So we recognize that this is indeed a very important threat to global economic development and therefore sustainable development. Even in India, we have seen a very clear shift in the burden of disease from what used to be called the diseases of underdevelopment, that is communicable diseases, maternal, neonatal and nutritional diseases, Cumulatively, which accounted for 60.9% of all deaths, all disability adjusted life years here in this diagram, in 1990, to what we can call the diseases of maladapted modernity, the non communicable diseases, which accounted for 55.4% of the disability adjusted life years in 2016. Now, the daily is a composite measure of premature mortality computed against the expected maximum life expectancy and the years with disability weighted for the degree of disability. Therefore, it captures both premature mortality and morbidity. Now, if you only look at NCD related deaths in India, in 2016, NCD caused 63% of the deaths and cardiovascular disease was the leading NCD accounting for 27% of the deaths. Now, these are going to rise further, especially cardiovascular disease, because large parts of India are still in a state of early to mid transition. A good deal of northern India, central India, northeastern India have not experienced the kind of rise in 
want to make a business in cardiovascular disease, but southern India and western India have experience. So as health transition sweeps across India, you are going to see proportional mortality rate as well as the absolute number of deaths mounting up. As far as obesity is concerned, in terms of the world, we can see that we have just now crossed the very critical threshold at the global level. For the first time in recorded human history, adult obesity has now officially overtaken adult underweight globally. Of course, we still have a huge challenge of childhood undernutrition. And as Dr. Ramachandran has already shown, this problem is very much with us even in India. For example, if you compare the ineffective data between 3 and 4, we see a rise in every segment of our population, whether we are talking about urban men and women or rural men and women, we are seeing that this is now an encompassing entity where obesity is now advancing across all sections of our society. And when we look particularly at women, we find that in NFHS 2, when obesity was then found out to be 10.6 percent, we have now in women, we have now moved to 20.7 percent in the National Family Health Survey. One of the questions, of course, is what is obesity in India? Are we only going by the threshold of 25 for overweight and 30 for obesity as defined globally? Comparable with global standards, or are we taking adiposity into account where Indians, along with many other Asian subgroups, have been found to have low muscle mass and a much higher level of fat and also distributed viscerally, which adds to great cardiometabolic risk even at the levels which are considered to be non obese. So, if we take what we call cardiometabolic obesity, then we are indeed at much greater risk. Than uh, we this, even these figures would suggest, and some of this translates into the risk of diabetes. Of course, the risk of diabetes is contributed by many things, and we do, in, in fact, in India, have a third of our patients who are thin diabetes. But we know that as overweight and obesity increases, and especially as body fat, uh, adiposity as well as visceral adiposity increase, our diabetes rates are going to rise. This is going to be seen in virtually every part of the world, especially in South Asia. Therefore, it is not surprising that ultimately, when the Sustainable Development Goals were adopted in 2015, the neglect that NCDs had in the year 2000 was now corrected and NCDs have now entered the SDG agenda. Even by mid 90s, it was very clear that many of the low and middle income countries were now seeing a very rapidly advancing epidemic of NCDs. But nevertheless, at that time, it was not found thought to be a problem of the poor, and it was thought to be, if at all, a problem of the rich in the low and middle income countries. But a lot of data has shown that these epidemics, in fact, are progressing so rapidly that the social gradient has reversed in many cases or is reversing, becoming a problem of the poor rather than just for the rich. And given that the equity dimension as well as the magnitude of the numbers and the economic impact, now NCDs have finally made it into the SDG agenda very clearly, along with many other sustainable development goals, some of which we'll deal with later, because all the goals are very much related to health, and many of the goals also have very good interaction with nutrition. So how does the entire SDG framework play out in the context of the nutrition agenda that we should examine later? So now if you look at the risk factors, so these keep changing somewhat in order within years, the latest estimate from the Global Burden of Disease study looked at this global play of risk factors which accounts for the maximum daily contribution the disability adjusted life year contribution. And child and maternal malnutrition still prevails as the number one risk factor. In 2015 it was considered to be number two, now again it's considered to be number one. There's been a lot of unsettling influence globally, including the conflict situations in Africa and the Middle East. For whatever reason, now we find that child and maternal malnutrition is 
indeed number one. But dietary risks by themselves, as estimated by the study, have now come to the number two position. But if you look at the other risk factors which feature in this list, whether it's high systolic blood pressure, or high fasting plasma glucose, or high body mass index, or high cholesterol, they are also mediated by dietary risk. So essentially, therefore, we are saying most of those risk factors which are in the top 10 list are diet related in one way or the other. And even when we look at air pollution, which we do not really consider to be nutrition related, one begins to speculate as to whether a good diet with a high antioxidant content can reduce the bodily impact of air pollution, which is a high oxidative stress phenomenon. So really, we cannot tease out nutrition from many of these risk factors. Of course, there is a variation between countries. Those countries with a low social development index, I mean, essentially, which are the low and middle income countries, have a much higher level of child, child and maternal malnutrition and air pollution, and dietary risks are somewhat lower down the scale, but still fairly important. Whereas in the middle income countries and the high income countries, we find dietary risks very much at the top. Now, when it comes to diet and non communicable diseases, this is the area of the greatest confusion over the last 20 years. And I think nutritional epidemiologists and cardiovascular epidemiologists have much to blame. If people are totally confused whether fats are good or which fats are good, which fats are bad, low carbohydrate, high carbohydrate, eggs are good, eggs are bad, dairy is good, dairy is bad, antioxidants good, bad. I think we have confused with our reductionist approach of trying to identify individual nutrients and sometimes even individual food items without taking into account composite diets. And that is where we have resulted in a huge amount of confusion which has made people cynical. That's why in the media you find overblown representations saying saturated fat doesn't matter. Then next says fat doesn't matter. Then somebody else says eggs are fine, cheese is fine, butter is fine, everything is fine. So the question is, it becomes extremely difficult to challenge the media when we do not stand on firm ground. So I believe now if we really look at where we stand with respect to diet and NCD connection, we have moved from specific nutrients to individual food items to dietary pattern, which is the way it should be. And in a sense, it brings back the ancient Indian wisdom where we are really looking at dietary patterns and rather than looking at single individual nutrients. And of course, for research purposes, we do get a lot of information by looking at individual nutrients. Whether we are talking about iodine or whether we are talking about omega-3, it's helpful to some extent to tease out some of those effects. But Ultimately, when we pack it into a diet, then it has to be a combination. I would say that the spectrum of science is reductionist in content, but holistic in context. It is like the rainbow. The individual colors of the rainbow are beautiful. But unless you use all of those colors, you will not get the brilliant white light of illumination that shows you the truth. So that is how we must look at science. Now, in terms of facts, American Association Heart Association guidelines in 2018 says that limit total fat is less than 25 to 35 percent of total energy. They have moved up 5 percent from some of their previous guidelines because of the impact of Mediterranean diet and so on. But even this is contested. We have a lot of people say, why are you emphasizing the quantity of fat? We should be talking only about the quality of fat. Limit saturated fat less than 7 percent of total energy it depends upon what you are substituting with. Limit trans fat to less than total or one person, less than one percent of total daily, daily energy. There seems to be some agreement on this. And remaining fat should come from sources of unsaturated fat, example, nut, seed, fatty fish, and vegetable oils. In terms of carbohydrates, we find low carb, high carb, medium carb, all kinds of controversies going on with fat diets coming on. And then we find yo-yo diets and people are actually going on all kinds of fantastic fat diets. And then that, that appears to reduce the weight, but with a 
rebound is a way much more than what they started with. So how do we make sense out of all this? It appears from the latest meta-analysis that both low and high carbohydrate consumption is associated with a greater mortality. So it's far better to have an intermediate carbohydrate or a moderate carbohydrate consumption of 50 to 55 percent. But the critical element is how much of that is refined carbohydrate and how much of that is unrefined carbohydrate. And therefore, that is where we ought to be looking at as well. Uh, mortality increased when carbohydrates were exchanged for animal uh, derived fat or protein and mortality decreased when the substitutions were plant based. Now, proteins, again, inverse association between protein intake and cardiovascular disease has been demonstrated. Um, but in the nurses' health study, diets low in red meat containing nuts, low fat dairy, poultry, or fish were associated with a 13% to 30% lower risk of carbohydrate uh, or coronary heart disease compared with diets high in meat. Uh, so, replacement of saturated fatty acids or carbohydrates by proteins so seems to have a beneficial effect on some of the cardiovascular risk factors like triglycerides, LDL, and SVP. But again, to emphasize, it is the source of the protein that appears to be very important. Plant proteins, nuts and beans, and tuna rich in L arginine seem to improve endothelial function. Dairy proteins appear to be beneficial. But again, as we are teasing out, if we have this message to the general public as to what the protein sources should be, if you are a non vegetarian, for a vegetarian, certainly the kind of uh, sources that you can get from plant foods is ideal. For a non vegetarian, I think the message still, as a matter of consensus, is fish is better than fowl, fowl is better than fish. In terms of fruit and vegetables, we find that there is overwhelming evidence from a variety of observational studies uh, that fruit and vegetables are very protective against coronary heart disease, against stroke, to some extent against cancers. And now we recognize that the fiber content as well as the antioxidant content and the variety of phytonutrients that these are packed with are very important indeed uh, for preventing uh, non-communicable diseases. Yet, we have not seen sufficient emphasis till recently on this. It's only in the recent global burden of disease studies that fruits and vegetables have been really coming up as important elements where the low consumption is now recorded to be an important risk factor for global burden of uh, preventable diseases. And we see this happening everywhere that in contrast to the WHO recommendations of about 500 grams per day of fruit and vegetables or at least 400 grams per day, we find that many of the countries are consuming far less and if this is the average per capita consumption, that means there are people who are actually rich and consuming much more than even this little average, and there are many who are poor and consuming much less than this average. So now we are beginning to come to some sort of a consensus that there are composite diets which seem to be associated with lower risk of NCDs and possibly with longevity. With studies showing, including clinical trials, the benefits of Mediterranean diet, DASH diet. Observational and ecological studies showing the benefits of Okinawa diet, the Oriental diet, and what's considered to be a poly meal as a challenge to the poly uh, pill of having good, uh, diverse diet assembled together with all the fat nutrients. Now, obviously, everybody is not going to eat a Mediterranean diet in every part of India. The idea is to take the principles of that kind of healthy composite diet and create our own regional variations of what appears to be a healthy, balanced diet. And dietary diversity becomes very important. So whole natural foods after an isolated fractions any day. Healthy, balanced portions from variety of foods and diverse food groups. Keep your weight controlled. Lots of physical activity. Stay hydrated and sleep well. This seems to be the general message that we should be sending out. And when I speak to school students, I say, a dining table has four legs, and that's how meal should be. Regularity, variety, balance, and moderation. Those should be the four legs of the dining table. However, this always doesn't get through. 
because there are forces beyond control, forces beyond what cardiologists will say or the nutritionists will say. According to Harvard, this is a healthy eating plate model with fruits and vegetables accounting for 49% of the plate, okay? And of course, very low amount of sugar and so on and so forth. Cereals and starches, 20%, etc., etc. But look at what actually we are producing according to FAO. It is exactly the reverse. And fruits and vegetables are 11%, cereals and starches are 47%. This is what the productive processes in the market are giving us. And because the public distribution system is also providing much more emphasis on cereals, naturally the production process also responds to that. And therefore our entire production process is skewed in the wrong direction because we are not really encouraging healthy diverse diet. So we ought to be really looking at a good system as to how we can actually craft and deliver some of these healthy diets to everybody across the population so that there is nutrition security rather than just food security. So we have to look at food systems. Food systems go well beyond production to storage, transport, trade, transformation, provisioning, retail. And food systems also govern the safety, nutrition quality, and affordability of food, which means multiple ministries are involved, and multiple agencies are involved, and we need coordination across all of those. So to improve nutrition for all, we will need to make changes in the food we produce, how it is processed, transported, marketed, and consumed. Therefore, we need a food systems perspective. Food transformation and, food and consumer demand after food production. Firstly, is agricultural production. Then we need the market and trade systems to be configured. Then food transformation and shaping the consumer demand. And also looking at the consumer purchasing power so that healthy foods are affordable. But so we are looking at food supply first. We are looking at food marketing next. We are looking at food transformation and retail, and we are looking at food demand on part of the consumer. And ultimately, this is going to the food choices. Now, obviously, this is quite related to many other things. It's also related to the environment. It's related to trade. It's related to multiple factors. So, if you look, for example, at the production dynamics, we are looking at the overall environmental situation where the weather, the climate and the atmosphere matter, then the terrestrial environment of land and water, the social environment, all of these influence the production process. Then in terms of supplies, the sourcing, processing, packaging, transport, marketing and retail. And ultimately we look at access, affordability and choice. And then we deliver nutrition. And through nutrition health and through health well-being. But there is also a slight diversion in the pathway in some of the food that produces wasted. Dr. Kutpar referred to it when he said 20% of the food given in the school meals is wasted. Now, that is also another issue that we have to deal with in the context of sustainable development. So, agriculture and food systems will have to be reconfigured to assure affordable access to diversified diets that are calorically adequate and nutritionally appropriate. So far, we have been worried about energy security. We have been counting poverty in terms of calories, not in terms of nutrition. So we now have to move the dialogue to nutrition security. And this has to be available to each person at every stage of his or her life in a sustainable manner. Economically sustainable and ecologically sustainable. Now that's where we face some challenges. We're facing the challenge Climate change, we are facing the challenge of diminished arable land, we are facing the challenge of water usage, even as urbanization and increase in global population are pushing up the demand for food, and changing food prices are creating food price volatility quite often. So, climate change, 
why are we even bothered about climate change in the context of nutrition? By year 2100, 40% of the world's land surface will likely experience altered climates, substantially altered climates. Uh, but even before that, by 2050, agricultural output is projected to fall by 2% per decade due to impact of climate change on crop and livestock production. Where food demand is projected to rise by 14% per decade due to population growth, urbanization, and poverty reduction. So how are we going to cope between this mismatch of rising demand and reducing supply? Obviously, technology is going to be used, or we are going to deforest much more and try and use more of that land. And that's again going to be creating a water crisis, land crisis, and climate crisis. Higher production of staple crops will not be enough to make agriculture more resilient to climate change or better able to address the world's need for improved diets. Nutrient-rich crops are even more susceptible to droughts, pests, diseases, and temperature fluctuations than staples. But even staples will be affected because higher carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is likely to reduce the nutrient content of staple crops. And soil degradation also reduces the nutrient quality. I don't know how many of you have visited Sundarbans recently. People in Sundarbans are moving away from the mangrove swamps in the coastal areas inward and are suffering food and nutrition insecurity. Two days ago, the BBC had a report on Bangladesh saying the same thing in a larger manner. Why? Because rising waters are increasing the salinity of the fish ponds are increasing the salinity of the rice fields, they are not able to grow anything there, they are moving inward, the families are losing their sources of nutrition, and children are suffering malnutrition. So this is a very early and direct influence of climate change that we can see on nutrition right before our eyes. We don't have to wait till 2050. Now, what are we doing about climate change, and how can agriculture actually interact with that? We know that livestock, particularly industrial scale livestock production, is a major contributor to greenhouse gases. The environmental economist Lord Nicholas Stern said 50% of the global greenhouse gas emissions actually come from agriculture and livestock. Whether we think that's too high a number or not, the fact is our modern agricultural and food systems throughout the value chain are degrading the environment. And a degraded environment for multiple reasons is also threatening agriculture and nutrition. So this is a mutually detrimental relationship. We have to somehow look at how to change that. It has been suggested in terms of the environmental footprint, in terms of the overall environmental degradation, a vegetarian diet or a vegan diet or a flexitarian diet are likely to be much more ecologically friendly. And Remember, we are now aiming for a very difficult target of 1.5 degree centigrade rise. Earlier, we had pitched for a 2 degree centigrade rise by 2100. Now, many of the island nations, the fastest countries and Maldives and others have said, by 2, by two degree rise, we'll all be submerged. So try and keep it at 1.5%. 1, 1.5 degrees centigrade. For that, agriculture and food systems have to make a contribution in terms of reducing the environmental degradation associated with them. And that's why we have to look at how global diets have to be altered. This problem has been largely invisible, but there's a recent article, I think in October 28th of Lancet uh, this year, uh, in which they said no single measure is enough, a synergistic combination of measures will be needed. This is in nature, October 28th. And while we may actually be reducing hunger by 2040, but there is a potential for worsening health outcomes in the absence of deliberate policy action. This is from the last. Now, nutrition sensitive food systems can also be climate smart. We need to actually build climate smart or climate resilient food systems. We need to support a variety of food production systems to minimize risks and enhance the supply of more diverse foods in the diet. Spread your bets. 
but that's also important for crop diversity, which is also important for dietary diversity. Promote efficiency, including waste minimization along the entire food value chain to meet the higher food demand and enhance resource use while achieving dietary diversification. Focus domestic research and investment on mitigating climate related food system shocks and volatility and adapting those systems to longer term stresses. Establish robust social protection programs so that the buffer and development does not suffer. Many countries are already now planning resilient crops, different varieties of beans that may be hardy and which will not be affected that much. So we have to really start looking at our agricultural research as well, looking at how we are going to cope in this future. So we need climate resilient and climate smart agriculture with crop diversity, especially non-staples and fruit and vegetables. We need sustainable fish production. Already we are exhausting our fish reserves by overfishing. Fiber preserving, food grain processing, which are stripping them of very valuable fiber. non heterogenic and non diabetogenic processed food products. And food safety against carcinogens. So this is how we have to shape our agricultural food systems as we move along, particularly from the context of NCDs. So what needs to be done? Sustainable resilient food systems for healthy diets, aligned health systems providing universal health coverage of essential nutrition actions, many of which were listed by Professor Ramachandran and by Professor Vinod Paul, social protection and nutrition education, trade and investment for improved nutrition. Trade is going to be a very important factor. Safe and supportive environment for nutrition at all ages and strengthen governance and accountability for nutrition. It is not a question of trying to say whether we are going to regulate or give entirely choice to the consumer. We need to empower the consumer but strengthen public policy for fighting against obesity and NCDs through appropriate regulation. So, we need to unleash the virtuous cycle of nutrition and sustainable development where we are really looking at nutrition as a basis for health, health as the basis for human development and humans actually promoting sustainable development. And not really concerned only about our generation, but looking at intergenerational health and development. But that means we need multi sectoral action across multiple sectors. And all of this needs to be positioned in the context of the sustainable development goals, where the goal now is compared to 2015, by 2030, we must reduce premature mortality in the age group of 30 to 70 years by one third. And that is the SDG target 3.4. But for this, we need to use the whole SDG framework and not just focus only on health or SDG goal 2, which is uh, zero hunger. For example, number one is no poverty, second is no hunger, third is good health, fourth is quality education, fifth is gender equality, sixth is clean water and sanitation, seventh is renewable energy, eighth is good jobs and economic growth. Ninth is innovation in infrastructure. Tenth is reduced inequality. Eleven is sustainable cities and communities. Twelve is responsible consumption. Thirteen is climate action. Fourteen is life below water. Fifteen is life on land. Sixteen is peace and justice. Seventeen is partnership for the goals. Now, it appears that many of the people who talk about nutrition are only focused on goal two or goal three. On the other hand, nutrition resonates with many of these goals. Let's see how. Number one, no poverty, secure access to land, agricultural development, they are vital for poverty reduction. Number two, of course, is a no-brainer, food production, calories and nutrients for zero hunger. Number three, for health, diet underpin health and agricultural pollution and uh, antimicrobial resistance and zoonosis, all of them are interconnected. Women agricultural labor and gender, women's access to land. Then when we are looking at World 6, 70% fresh water is used for agriculture and agricultural pollution of water. How will you actually look at that? Then land for bioenergy, solar and wind and water for hydroelectricity. Uh, 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 so how do we look at energy security? Remember, as the demand for food grows, we must increase our food production with lower utilization 
for lower cost of per unit land, energy, and water. So with less water, less land, less energy, we must actually produce more food. Then jobs. There are more than one billion jobs in agriculture. And agricultural development has to increase. It just can't be prospered industrialization. Then infrastructure drives land use change. How do we actually deal with that? What about land for urbanization and also urban agriculture? Urbanization and dietary demand. All of these are ma ma matters uh, that uh, relate to uh, the growth of city. Then in terms of consumption, what are the dietary choices? What is grown? Overconsumption, food waste. Then agriculture and land use. How is it actually resulting in 30% uh, of the greenhouse gases? Then in terms of pollution from agricultural runoff, how is the water resources being uh, affected? How is the fishing uh, uh, being affected in terms of overfishing? What is the impact of crop feed aqu aquaculture? So all of these actually make a lot of difference. So when we are talking about biodiversity, habitat destruction and degradation, species loss, ecosystem services, every one of these matters. So you see, nutrition is actually laced through the entire SDG framework. And we face challenges. The global middle class is expected to increase by 3 billion in 2030. This will increase demand for energy by 45%, water by 30%, and food by 50%. How do we actually manage this equation? Where will these people live? What will they choose to spend their money on? All of this will impact upon this issue as we move along. And we in India, with a growing economy, are going to see all of this. Now, for example, in Asia, this is where the maximum rise in the demand for animal source feed is coming up now because of growing middle class and aspirational dietary patterns. So this is where we're going to see a good deal of challenge. And we also are going to see both global and domestic factors which are going to be challenging. We are going to be seeing impact from global production, through disrupted production and supply chains with extreme weather events. We are going to see food safety being compromised. We are going to see at the domestic level risk to agriculture from domestic water extremes, price volatility and disrupted food supply. We are going to see long term trends in domestic production also being affected by global trends. And trade is going to be particularly an important element. And all of this is going to result in decreased food affordability for vulnerable groups. So we now recognize it's not only undernutrition that's only going to cause problems, but undernutrition in terms of essential fiber, fruit and vegetables, essential healthy edible oils is also going to hit the poor and by way of MTVs. So given these challenges, how are we going to configure our future? So, you can have unsustainable and unhealthy diet, or you can have sustainable and healthy diet. So, one way of looking at it is free trade and the global market situation is to have a carbon tax, impose the polluter based principle on the transnational corporations, of course, have a lot of consumer education, but climate costs are going to be mounting and food will become more expensive. Or focus a lot more on local and regional markets, have a food tax. To try and modify the consumer behavior and have provide healthy eating incentive schemes, health insurance, and public health education. We still can end up with both health and sustainable diets. So, how are we going to be really shaping our future? It's going to be very critical and dependent on the food system, not just on what we decide is good nutrition based on science. So, in the 20th century, the focus of nutrition policy was on technology-aided production, green revolution. Let's push up wherever in the world, increase our production. Emphasis on individual behavior change. We try and eat healthy foods, even though we are producing livestock. Now, 21st century, the focus has to be both on production and consumption patterns, which are compatible with sustainable development. And the emphasis, therefore, on system thinking for broader societal change. Now, people will say, it's a matter of choice. Under nutrition, yes, it's a matter of supply, availability, pricing, we'll provide it with public distribution systems, school meals, and so on. 
But when it comes to NCDs, it's a matter of individual choice. Why are you trying to regulate anything? Let people decide what they want to eat. That's what the industry will say. That's what the industry says now. So choice is either conscious, conditioned, or compelled. I can make a choice based on good information or bad information. That's a conscious choice. Or it can be conditioned by marketing and promotion, by aggressive advertising, by cultural factors which condition my choices. Or it may be compelled or constrained on basis of availability or affordability. I may be fully educated that I must have five health foods and fruits and vegetables a day, but if the prices are skyrocketing in the market, I will not be able to buy it. So these are some of the issues that come up when we are talking about healthy edible oils versus unhealthy edible oils and what the comparative prices are. So, nutritionists and cardiovascularists, epidemiologists and cardiologists cannot deal with the situation only by looking at their own areas of science. They'll have to see how they can influence through the food systems the state of the market. Because the market has now become the dominant key. For this, we need firstly have an increased consumer consciousness, try and move industry practices by providing Incentives and disincentives so that they can actually produce healthier products, which requires a national policy framework, which provides those kind of incentives and disincentives. The carrot and stick approach. You need incentives and regulation. Carrot and the stick. Or the frozen carrot, that's the government policy. Because the frozen carrot is both a carrot and a stick. Right? So now, you also can use global covenants, global agreements, like in the case of tobacco. So you can try and get some agreements on food. The FSSAI is moving towards some of these regulatory measures, nutrient-specific guidelines on fats and sugars, taxes on high, highly processed commodities and sugar sweetened beverages, reformulation of commercialized products, positive nutrition labeling, Provide, provide a nutrition sensitive and enabling environment and safe and nutritious food at school. Okay. But am I saying that we don't need nutrition science and research? No, I'm not saying that. These are the domains that nutritionists relate to foods, nutrients, cooking practices, eating patterns, digestion and assimilation, physical activity, hormones, biomarkers, immunity, anthropometrics, pathological markers, genes. Epigenetic, you know, the microbiome. We need all that science. But there are also domains that relate to nutrition, agriculture, food processing, water, sanitation, health system, education, income, equity, transport, communication, media, trade, environment, and political systems. So we need to work together in order to change the scenario by bringing in all of these areas of knowledge into reformulating our agriculture and food system towards better nutrition. As food systems evolve to address the challenges of population growth, environmental challenge and economic instability, we should ensure that they also improve nutrition. So what are the scenarios we should promote? We need both healthy diet and sustainable diet as we said. And therefore, we should recognize the link between diversity of diet and biodiversity, and then provide a higher diversity of farm-based products for stronger sustainability. At the same time, overconsumption of animal-based sources should be reduced, particularly reduction in meat consumption, which leads both to healthier diet as well as greater sustainability by reducing the stress on the environment. So we are moving much more to plant-based diets, or at least a flexitarian diet. And we also cannot ignore the intergenerational aspect in saying that this has to begin early. School meals can be transformational with emphasis on nutritious ingredients and food groups. And regional procurement. If schools can actually get regional agricultural products produced, that will also be an incentive for local agriculture and boost the local economy and also ensure diversification of food. 
predictable national budget allocations for these, an effective intersectoral mechanism for managing such programs with careful measurement and monitoring, and encourage children's lifelong healthy habits, and also children can be changing at home, and nutrition education, community engagement, school gardening and training, all of these are important. We can't deal only with the 30 to 70 year age group, even if that's the goal in the SDGs, for NCDs, we have to begin early on in life. And therefore, better with school meals will produce better nutrition status, better health status, social harmony, community engagement, connect to local farming, improve sports performance, and improve educational outcomes. And this is something we should work on. But as yields grow, waste also grows faster, and 1.3 billion metric tons or one third of food available for human consumption. One third of food available for human consumption never reaches the plate or the bowl. This is a huge waste and that is against sustainable development. Food waste is down in the value chain where we are looking at discarding of food downstream in the value chain, particularly at retailer and consumer levels for the risk of quality or spoilage. But food loss is higher up in the value chain because of decrease in the quantity or quality of food intended for human consumption, for example in agricultural production, post harvest losses, or during transformation. Global food loss and waste cost $940 billion a year. And the highest economic losses occur for cereals in the post-harvest handling and storage, fruit and vegetables in transformation and packaging, and meat and seafood and milk at the distribution and the retail level. So we need to look at different levels where wastage occurs and then look at it. The very foods that are critical components of healthy diets are at the highest risk of loss and waste, particularly fruit and vegetables. They are the ones that are most lost and wasted. And there are multiple areas of waste, multiple sources, at the agricultural production subsystem, food storage, transport and trade subsystem, food retail and provisioning subsystem, and food transformation subsystem. All of them are involved in this. And ultimately, the consumer also wastes a lot, and all of these cumulatively lead to Waste. And policy solutions are there at each level, and we ought to address those policy solutions very importantly, whether we are improving storage technologies, or improving packaged food for pressure, or not discarding things just because of cosmetic standards, or addressing proper storage at the consumption level, or improving retail storage practices, and so on. A new global panel study, the Global Panel on Agriculture and Food Systems and Nutrition, shows that reducing food loss and waste would have substantial nutritional benefits. If we follow the current scenario, business as usual, food loss, waste would rise by, would rise to, rise by 37%. By 2030, 25% of the calories and protein produced, 25% of water of the calories and protein produced would be lost to consumers, along with 18% to 41% of vitamins and minerals. On the other hand, if we actually cut down the waste by 50%, we will be able to increase the supply of folate, vitamin A, riboflavin, folate, and calcium, which will substantially decrease. So the priority areas for this are make food reduction and food loss and waste a global policy and agenda, agenda on par with producing more food. Again, the nutrition community has to take a stand in this. Food waste has never really been a part of our general discussion. Take practical steps at all points across the food system to retain nutrients produced, invest in public and private infrastructure at all levels, encourage innovation in technology, system efficiencies, policies, and practices for preserving the nutrition and reducing the loss in the higher up in the value chain. Loss and waste in nutritious foods would yield substantial benefits not only for human health, but for global economies and the environment. So we see now that. When we talk about sustainable development, it's not an airy-fairy thing. It is dealing with our economic development, it is dealing with our ecological sustainability, environmental stability, and of course, with health and nutrition as the basis for human development of this generation and intergenerationally. Unless we bring nutrition very much into the center of this, we will not be able to influence many of the policy decisions that actually will impact on nutrition. So nutrition, nutrition is now, must now begin engaging much more effectively, even aggressively, 
with other policy sectors and say, this is what nutrition should be if we want a healthy, sustainable uh, development and if we want an environmentally stable planet. So, when we talk about science leading to policy and policy to action, nutrition is the spa of health transformation and sustainable development. You have the power in your hands, you should use it. Dr. Devi, come. Please come and become the chairperson for this session. We, I was mistaken me holding forth until you arrived. Please come, sir. Uh, Dr. Devi, that was, as usual, one of the most exhaustive and enlightening integrated talk. Uh, I'm sure all the audience enjoyed it. Um, I honestly wish two people who could have enjoyed this much more than any of us because of their lifelong involvement in these two sectors. Dr. Gopalan and Dr. Swaminathan were here to listen to you and they would have felt extremely happy. We would do one thing, make the video copy of all this and send it to both of us, both of them, so that they can hear it. So far, uh, we have not taken too many questions. Now is the time. First, the audience from here will ask a question. Dr. Kuldeep Singh will now get his students ready to ask questions. And finally, the Negrin Center people, if they have any questions, we will take Dr. Reddy. Come back and show their way to me. Thank you. you know, it's a pleasure to greet uh, friends from both Jodhpur and uh, Shillong. I really hope uh, this long lecture, which Dr. Premier Amshin has very kindly permitted me to do, has not uh, stunned everybody into silence and there will be some questions. Yeah. Revenge, revenge of my PhD student. siloed disciplines and in institutions which have also been restricted in terms of their engagement with other institutions and other disciplines. We must now start looking at what are the major challenges and try and create platforms where we can all dialogue together and discuss together. I'm not saying that people should give up their pursuit of nutrition science. They should do that very well. Or somebody who is actually a researcher, for example, in cardiovascular disease should be able to do cardiovascular disease or diabetes epidemiology quite well. But ultimately when we are looking for solutions, we will have to bring all the forces together. And that's where I think we need to create consultative platforms at the level of knowledge integration. At the level of policy, I think as somebody was saying uh, at lunchtime during the conversation, that it is very important that different ministries and different agencies also sit together and there is actually a, a sort of a nutrition council or a nutrition task force. Uh, in fact, uh, I was told that in Brazil there is a nutrition council with 17 different ministries actually working together. So whether it's food processing or agriculture, water resources, they all have to sit together. 
And I think the right platform would be either Prime Minister's office, which of course is beset with multiple problems, or the Niti Ayo, which is the think tank. That's where we need to bring in this kind of convergence. Far too long nutrition has been boxed up in WCD or in health, and even they did not talk to each other. We need to change that situation, and we can only change that situation by throwing more challenges into the open and getting the public debate going. Let me, because there's not been much of questioning, let me reflect briefly on some of the things that we had before lunch. Firstly, under nutrition and NCDs are quite well related, as Dr. Demar Ramchandran said. Uh, Intrauterine undernutrition as well as early developmental uh, undernutrition, particularly in the first two years. With rebound adiposity can set the stage for non communicable disease later on. But one of the questions that comes up in the context of uh, the talk on energy consumption is Dr. Pat's talk. Is the fact is we have higher body adiposity in lower muscle mass. But that needs not be so. I mean, that is not something we should take as a given forever and ever. We should look at interventions of adding appropriate nutrition and physical activity, which actually improve the conditions with with that respect. So, I think not looking at just how much energy, but where is that energy coming from, how balanced is the diet, how diverse is the diet, and even if there are extra calories supposedly being consumed, are they being consumed as fruit and vegetables or are they being consumed as nuts, ultimately are they going into a better quality of the human body, which is then able to utilize this energy better. Those are the kind of challenges that we have to be looking at when we are addressing nutrition. Well, I do not think we can actually lock ourselves into a system feeling that we are going to be forever living with high body adiposity and low muscle mass. We need questions from your report. It is on the line. Please, in one second. We have an audio problem. They can listen when we are transmitting. They can very, very difficult for us to understand what we are saying. Mm-hmm. Then he has a quote. You see, he himself gave the answer. He has dealt with every aspect and given an absolute uh, base, theoretical basis of the way forward. What we need to learn is today's theories, tomorrow's practice, and I hope it really helps. And you should keep talking until such time the rest of the population understand and follow you. Sir? As a token of our appreciation, we always do put in the So that you know, we are going to do a photo of because what the Gopalans want each one of the speakers receiving now, I think about the 